Once upon a time, there was a world where people walked at night and were not afraid, where churchyards were places of rest, where marble slabs remained firm and solid earth did not crumble and fall away. This is a story about the end of that world. Boneyard, and now even the radio dies. It could be the trees, Johnny. Maybe, you know, they're blocking the waves or something. Well, excuse me. I didn't know I was in the presence of an electronics expert. Maybe you can use your vast knowledge of radio and navigation to find your old man's final resting place. Driving 200 miles to put the wreath on the grave of someone I don't even remember isn't my idea of a fun Sunday. Well, it's only once a year, and it makes Mom happy. You know, I think we're almost there. I'm sure I recognize this place. Did you understand what that guy was talking about on the radio? Something about an emergency? Yeah, big emergency. Maybe they've run short of alfalfa. The cider's contaminated. Whatever it is, it's not going to change our lives any. We could drop dead right now, and no one around here would even notice. Look, there it is up on the left. If you turn into the drive and go to the top of the hill, it'll be around there somewhere. Do you remember where the grave is? I'm not too sure, and it's getting dark. You're the expert. Look for it yourself. I've been doing all the driving, remember? There it is. Oh, look at all the weeds. Don't these places have caretakers or something? Yeah, and it looks like your prayers are answered. Where? I don't see anyone. That's because he's not really there. He's a spook. He comes out of the grave. Then he hides until you get right on top of him. Then he pounces. <laughs> He's dead, but he won't lie down. Oh, now I see him. Shut up, he'll hear you. He doesn't care. The dead don't care. The dead don't hear. Did you know that, little sister? When you're dead, the first thing that goes is your eardrums. The worms get in and eat them as a delicacy. Then they use the channels to breathe in. You're disgusting. Look, he's coming towards us. I'm going to talk to him about cleaning up here. Where are you going? Back to the car. You two can fight it out. Excuse me, but do you work here? If you could... What are you doing? Ah, Jenny, help me! Ah! You crazy degenerate bastard! Get off her! Run, Barbara! Get the car started! Barbara ran, but Johnny didn't. He was too busy fighting the man, if man it was. A man with staring eyes and oddly pulpy body that absorbed the blows pounding into him. The body that stank more than any living body should. The body that overpowered Johnny's younger, stronger one, ripping out his throat, smashing his skull against a rock, then delving deep inside. Oh, God! Oh, God, where are the keys? Oh, no, Johnny's still got them. Johnny, come on. Oh, no. Barbara looked for her brother. She saw him and the thing that straddled his body, its face smeared with blood. She did not wonder where the blood came from, for she could see the gaping hole in her brother's neck. But she felt no grief, only a mad desire to escape from the figure that now began to shamble towards her, bloody hands outstretched, scrabbling at the windows of the car and leaving pink smears all over them. Somehow, she released the handbrake, put the car in neutral and her body thrashing in terror and the pounding outside set gravity in motion. It began to roll forward, uh, gently at first, then faster, as if it sensed the terror that was behind it, the terror that pursued like a blind robot under the control of an unholy master. But hills don't go on forever unless they lead straight to hell. Finally, the road leveled then began to climb upward and the car slowed 
stopped and slipped back until Barbara pulled on the brake. But the thing behind had no brakes. Frantically scanning the horizon, the girl saw a small farmhouse about 100 yards distant. To the left of the house was a gas pump. Barbara jumped from the car and ran until the solid wooden door of the farmhouse barred her flight. Help! Oh, help me, please! For God's sake, help me! Let me in! Open this door, damn you! Oh, my God, it's open! Oh, good. Is anyone home? Please, there's a man in outside. I've got to call the police. Where's the phone? Oh, there it is. Hello? Hello? Why the hell don't you answer? Let's try the radio. It's dead. Is everything dead in this fucking place? Will somebody tell me what's going on? And the man who killed him is sitting up under that tree as though nothing happened. You okay? Get inside, quick now. <laughs> Look, I'm not gonna hurt you. I ain't one of them creeps. My name's Ben. Don't worry about that guy outside. There's lots more where you come from. But we'll be okay if I can get some gas. My truck's just about dry. You got the key to the pump? Pump? The gas pump out front. It's locked. Give me the key so we can gas up and go. It's the only chance we got. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't live here. My brother's dead. You're talking about gas pumps and my brother's out of there with his throat torn out and the man who killed him is sitting under a tree watching us. <laughs> you got a friend with him now. Soon there'll be others. They know we're here. See that kindling over there? Now find some newspaper and we'll start a fire. Kindling? Kindling! Wood! Anything! They're, they're frightened the fire! I'm gonna start a blaze out there that'll burn the rotten flesh clean off their bones if they come too close. I'm gonna get you! I'm gonna get all of you, you filthy scum bastards! But who are they? Not who. What? Now turn on that radio and see if you can get some more news. <laughs> Emergency Radio Network. Normal broadcasting facilities have been temporarily discontinued. Stay tuned to this network for emergency information. Your law enforcement agencies urge you to remain in your homes. Keep all doors and windows boarded shut. Use all food, water, and medical supplies sparingly. Civil defense forces are attempting to gain control of the situation. Stay near your radio and stay tuned to this frequency. Do not use your automobile. Remain in your homes. Keep all doors and windows locked. Okay. Forget about the gas for a while. We're going to have to hold up here for a bit. Now snap out of it and help me barricade these doors and windows, will you? I'm going to bust up every bit of furniture I can find and you look for a hammer and some nails. What's your name, anyway? Barbara. All right, and Barbara, I know you've been through a terrible time, but you've got to put it out of your mind for now. Take a look under the kitchen sink for the hammer while I see the furniture. Our broadcasters will convey information as received from Civil Defense Headquarters. Uh, this is your Civil Defense Radio Network. Normal broadcasting facilities have been temporarily discontinued. Stay tuned to this wavelength. Turn the goddamn radio off. Starting to repeat itself. Kind of hammer and nails? There's a hammer and a jar full of nails. Good girl. Now bring them over here and hand me the nails while I work on this window. Lucky this place ain't too big. What are those things out there? Don't rightly know. And they're not human, that's for sure. Might have been once, but uh, no more. No, sir. Uh, give me a couple more nails. All I know is I was out of town on my job and I was waiting at the station to get home to see my kids. Only the train didn't show. And I waited and I waited. No one seemed to know what was going on, so I started to hitch. You know, okay, that's fine. Now over to the next one. 
Anyways, uh, no one would pick me up. But, uh, well, that ain't surprising, because folks don't pick up black hitchhikers, do they? Then I get to this little town, and uh, it's all wrong somehow. Looks like the plague's hit it. Only no plague I know leaves people all tore up and bloody. Then I pass a diner, and I hear radio blasting, and I, I know i got to get me home as quick as possible to my two boys. And their ma's dead, and all they got is me and my mother. So I seen this, this pickup truck, and a guy lying beside it with his head pulled off, and his keys are still in ignition. So I take off like a bat out of hell, and uh, things I see along the way, I ain't going to tell you about. Okay, let's do the door now. And I get to this town here, just over the other side of the hill, but I'm nearly out of gas, and I see a Sunoco station, nice and handy. But before I get to it, I have to pass another diner. And there comes a big gasoline truck roaring out of the parking lot. Damn near knocked me off the road. And there's about ten or fifteen of those things clinging on to it. And some of them are, are reaching into the driver's cab, and one of them has his arms around the driver's neck, and the truck goes clear across the road, right through the pumps, and boom! Everything blows. One big bang. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll keep them out. It's through the back of the house now. Uh, we'll leave the upstairs. There's no uh, overhanging trees, and they don't seem to be able to climb. <sighs> what was I? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the things still on the truck are blazing, and the rest are shuffling away as though they're scared of fire. And the driver, the poor bastard, he can't get out of his cab, and he's screaming because he's being cooked alive. And you know, I, hell, I never thought I'd say this, but it's a better way to go than being caught by those things. Then I take another look at the diner, and I see all its windows broken, and the door off the hinges, and all the cars still parked outside. And I knew those things were in there. Only it wasn't the food they were after. Least of all, not the sort you and me eat. <laughs> Sorry, honey. I had mixed stuff. Look, uh, can, can you hear me? I'm going to carry you upstairs to one of the bedrooms. You'll be safe there. You lie down and rest, and when you feel better, you can come down again and, and help me. I'm all right. I'd feel safer if I stayed with you. I can't stand the thought of those things outside waiting. I think I'm going mad. No, no, you're not. Why don't you take a look around for some wood? Hey, try that closet. There's no wood, but there's something else. Oh, thank God, is there something else? A rifle! See any shells? A whole box. Oh, that's great. You know, this could be a hell of a lot worse. It could? <laughs> yeah, turn the radio on, will you? Might be some more news. Latest bulletins from Emergency Central. Up to the minute reports inform us that the seed which started in the eastern part of the country has now spread across the entire nation, and reports are that it might be worldwide. Medical and scientific advisors have been summoned to the White House, and Washington informs us that the President is about to address the nation. Y yes, ladies and gentlemen, the President. Well, uh, the strange beings that have appeared in many parts of our nation seem to have certain predictable patterns of behavior. Uh, in the few hours before initial reports of violence and homicidal attacks... It has been established that the alien beings are human in many ways. Uh, theories as to their origin and their aims have been so diverse that at this point we have to state that these factors are as yet unknown. Uh, teams of scientists and physicians presently have the corpses of several of the aggressors, and these corpses are being studied for clues that might confirm or negate existing theories. The most overwhelming fact is that these beings are infiltrating through urban and rural areas across the nation in forces of varying numbers, and you've got to take every precaution. Attack may come at any time and any place without warning. Uh, repeating the important facts from our previous reports, uh, there is an aggressive army of unexplained, unidentified humanoid beings, and these beings are totally irrational in their violence. Uh, they are weak in physical strength and can be distinguished from humans by their deformed appearance. 
Uh, they are usually unarmed and do not appear to be capable of handling weapons. Uh, they are not like an organized army, have no apparent battle plan, and can be stopped by immediate immobilization, either by blinding or dismembering. If encountered, they are to be avoided or uh, destroyed. Under no circumstances should you allow yourselves or your families to be alone or unguarded while this menace prevails. These beings are flesh eaters, and they eat the flesh of the victims they kill. Indeed, the principal characteristics of their onslaught is their depraved, insane quest for human flesh. I repeat, these alien beings are eating the flesh of their victims. We're gonna die! We're gonna die! We're gonna die! Oh, shit, we are! You want me to slap you again? I want to get out of here. Well, you can't. We're sealed in, and they are sealed out. And we gotta stay here till things change. Ah! Ah! The door over there! Yeah, 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 probably leads to the cellar. What about it? It's opening! They're coming to get us! Holy Christ, I didn't check the cellar. Where's the gun? Don't shoot! We're the same as you! That's the first time a white man's ever said that to me. Honest, mister. We're okay. We're, we're from town. My name's Harry Cooper. This young fella's Tom something or other. We've been holed up in the cellar. Yeah, that's right. And I've been up here busting my balls trying to make this place safe while you've been down there all this time all tucked up nice and cozy like. Couldn't you hear the racket we've been making? How are we supposed to know who you were, huh? You could have been those things trying to get in. You couldn't hear the girls screaming? These things don't scream, you know. We're not experts on their behavior patterns, and the walls are too thick to hear anything. Anyway, the racket you were making sounded as though the place was being ripped apart. Wait a minute, you bastard. First, you say the walls are too thick to hear. Then in the next breath, you say you thought the place was being ripped apart. Now, how about getting your story straight before you mouth off? Bullshit! I, I, I don't have to take any crap from you. We found a safe place in the cellar, and I wasn't going to risk it for any stranger who happened to wander in. Why don't we all calm down, huh? I'll be calm when I'm safely back in the cellar. Look, mister, they can't get in. Everything's boarded over down here, and the only weak spots are the windows upstairs, and all I need is a little more time to fix them up. You haven't got any more time! Those things are going to get in, and the cellar is the safest place there is. They overturn my car, and they'll bust through your barricades like a knife going through butter. Now, Harry's a bit upset, mister. He's got his wife and kid downstairs, and the kid's hurt pretty bad. Hmm. Sorry about that. I still think we're better off up here. They'll get us up here. They turned my car over. You keep saying that. They don't have any strength, I tell you. I've already killed three of them. Any four or five normal people can overturn a car if you let them. That's my whole point. There's going to be more than three, ten, twenty, thirty. Who knows? This place is going to be crawling with them. Man, you're a real little merry sunshine. That many and we don't stand a chance, period. This is still the best place. Now, say you go back down the cellar. That leaves you with just one door to defend. Well, great. But that works both ways. It's your only way out, too. What are you going to do if they come down the stairs ten at a time? You got a flamethrower handy by any chance? Up here, we've got at least some options open. Keep the cellars a last resort if we can't fight them off up here. That makes sense, Mr. Cooper. Let's stay up here. You stay the hell where you like. I'm going back down there, and I'm going to bolt that door behind me, and it doesn't get unlocked again until the, the National Guard tells me to open it. Why is everybody arguing? What's the matter with her? Why, you for one. How are you going to know it's the National Guard? Could be them things trying to get in, you know. Don't forget, you can't hear anything down there. Or so you say. Man, you think they've got the time or the manpower to search every house in the country? This thing is all over. It could be weeks before they get here. For that, you could starve them. Go out of your head. Well, you're right, mister. 
We should stay up here, Mr. Cooper. Are there any more of those things outside, mister? Ben's the name, kid. Oh, six or eight, I'm thinking. Didn't anyone believe in cremation around here? I'm going downstairs. You stewing your own damn juice. They're, they're coming at us. Ben and Tom ran over to one of the windows where gray and rotting hands were trying to force their way in. Ben slammed the heavy rifle butt down on the groping fingers. Oblivious to the pain, they continued to scrabble at the wood, trying to rip it free from the nails that held it to the frame. Then, a face replaced the hands, or part of the face, for rotting flesh hung down in shreds, exposing the cheekbones while one dead eye dangled down the face on a string. Men fired the rifle point-blank, and the head sailed away, leaving the torso to crumble on the ground. But another took its place. The gun roared again, and a huge hole was blasted in its upper chest, but it merely staggered, then moved forwards, the moonlight glinting through its torso, exposing things that should never be seen by man. Ben fired again, smashing its hip. The thing went down awkwardly, tried to rise, fell again, and began crawling in aimless circles. The rest of the things retreated to the trees. Fierce! Harry? Harry, are you all right? What's happening up there? It's all right. That settles it. Back to the cellar. Yeah, it's all yours, man. You get out of my sight and rot down there. We'll need food. Oh, yeah? Keep away from that refrigerator or I'll blow your goddamn head off. You can have your cellar and everything that's in it. This floor... And upstairs is my territory, and everything here, from the food to the radio, is mine. Now get the fuck out of here. Tom, this man is crazy. Are you going to let him get away with it? We have a right to food. I'm staying up here. You can too. I've got a wife and sick kid down there. Yeah, yeah. Well, I feel sorry for them, you know. They've got to depend on a dumb, gutless wonder for a man. That's okay. That's okay. You go be king of the shit pile down there, and I'll be king up here, and we'll see who makes out the best. And if anything happens to us, you can come up here and fight the things for the food. You bastards! Send Judy up when you go down. She'll want to be with me. Well, who's Judy? My girlfriend. Jesus! Another one! Why didn't you say she was down there? Well, you, you didn't give me much of a chance. <laughs> no. Uh, no, kid, I, I guess I didn't. Judy walked up the cellar steps and into the living room. She was a tall, thin, blonde-haired girl of about seventeen and looked as though a puff of wind would blow her away. Tom had a good pair of shoulders on him, but was obviously little more than a kid. Over in the corner, Barbara lay on the couch, eyes closed, in a semi-catatonic state. Ben looked them over, and his insides contracted. Two nice kids, a crazy girl, and downstairs a whining coward who'd sell you out in a minute, his wife, and a sick child. While outside, he closed his mind and spoke. Hi, Judy. My name's Ben. Uh, the girl over there on the couch is Barbara. Her brother got killed out there, and she still shook up. I'm glad you're here. The more of us, the better chance we got. This door is closed, and it stays closed. It won't be open again ever. Go drown in your shit, asshole! He'll starve down there, and his kid's awful sick. Yeah, well, don't worry about him. I know his type. Give him a day or less, and he'll be back up here whining for food. And I give it to him. Not that he deserves it, but because of his family. Harry walked down the steps of his chosen prison. The place had been used as a storeroom, and the walls were lined with heavy cardboard boxes of varying shapes and sizes. Under the ceiling, there was the usual tangle of water, gas, and electricity pipes, and from those were hung thin ropes for clotheslines. These caused Harry to bend over and crouch, 
fortifying the gothic image of a hunchbacked jailer on his way to torment his victims, while broken and discarded domestic appliances gave the illusion of sophisticated instruments of torture. Presiding over this scene of marital bliss was Helen, Harry's long-suffering wife. A pretty, faded woman in her mid-thirties, she was bent over a sink, wetting a handkerchief. Her five-year-old daughter lay motionless on an old wooden table. The sound of her breathing was not a good sound. She's got a bad fever. There's two more people upstairs. One's a troublemaker, thinks he knows it all. I offered to share this place with him, but he wouldn't listen. And now he's got Tom and Judy on his side. They should have listened to me. Karen needs help, Harry. She needs a doctor. Oh, sure. Nothing simpler. I'll, I'll just stroll down to the town, and if any of those things come up to me, I'll say, uh, Excuse me, my kid's sick. Uh, let me through, will you? They'll understand. Uh, you know, I hate you. I think I've always hated you. Harry? Harry, can you hear me down there? Yes, Tom, we can hear you. Helen, we've got food and water up here. Maybe we can help Karen. There's going to be a special message on the radio in ten minutes telling us what to do. Don't listen to him. He'll get us all killed. Get your slimy hands off me. You haven't got the guts of a louse. I'm going up there. We'll be up, Tom. Okay, it's your decision. Don't blame me if we all get killed. Once more, the cellar steps echoed to the sound of footsteps. The door was unbolted from the inside, and Harry and his wife appeared, the former looking sullen, the latter blinking in the strong electric light. My name's Ben. I'm glad you changed your minds. Where's your little girl? She's sleeping downstairs. She's very sick. Uh, Judy's in the kitchen. I'll get her to keep an eye on Karen while you listen to the radio. You need a break. Oh, thank you. What's wrong with that girl on the couch? I think she's in shock. Her brother got killed by those things, and she only just got away. Oh, poor thing. Harry, that poor girl's brother was killed. This place is never going to hold. There's a million weak spots all around us. You haven't heard a thing I've said, have you? All you care about is your own rotten skin. If it's that bad, why don't you pick up a hammer and do something instead of bitching and moaning all the time? You can't see a thing with all that wood across the windows. There could be a million of those things out there just waiting to get us. And why doesn't someone wake that girl up? If there's a plan, I want her to hear it with the rest of us. I don't want to waste time later explaining when we could be getting away. You leave her alone, you hear? I'm in charge here. And you take your orders from me, not to give them. You wake that girl up before she's ready. And you're a dead man. Citizens are urged to remain in their homes. Those who ignore this warning only expose themselves to danger from the aggressors and from armed citizens who have been instructed to shoot first and ask questions afterwards. Isolated families are in extreme danger. Any escape attempts should be made in heavily armed groups and by motor vehicle, if possible. Fire is also an effective weapon. These beings are highly inflammable. Manned defense outposts have been established on major arteries leading to all communities. These outposts are equipped to defend all refugees and to offer medical and surgical assistance. Police and vigilante patrols are in the process of combing remote areas in search and destroy missions against the aggressors. These patrols are attempting to evacuate isolated families, but rescue efforts are proceeding slowly due to the sheer enormity of the task. We now bring you Sheriff C.W. McClellan, Chief of the County Police. Well, folks, things aren't going too badly. We killed 19 of the things today and might have had more. Only my men had to stop to eat and drink. Sheriff, can we defeat these things? Sure we can. All you got to do is shoot for the brain. Or if you ain't got a gun, just lop their heads off. A machete should do it. Or uh, burn them. Yes, sir, they go up like wax paper if you put a light to them. Only don't let them get too close. So, you think you'll have the situation under control? In time. Least ways in our part of the world. Can't speak for anywhere else. <laughs> They're pretty weak, and the only way they can get you is to take you by surprise, or by sheer force of numbers. Only don't wait around waiting for us to rescue you if you're low on food or in any immediate danger. Now, we'll, we'll, we'll try like hell to get to you before they do, but it might take days. So, if you're a large group, strike out on your own. 
or hold up somewhere safe and try and get some sort of signal out so we know where you are. <laughs> you might just set some of those critters on fire and send us a smoke signal. Uh, but what exactly are those uh, critters, Sheriff? Oh, they're deadens. Right enough. Only what brought them back to life, I don't know. Not my concern, either. My job's to put them back in the ground a second time and make certain they stay there. Thank you, Sheriff McClellan. And now, please remain in your homes with all the doors and windows locked and securely fastened. We will be with you every hour on the hour with updated reports on this national emergency. Oh, that was a big hip. Don't wait for rescue, but lock all your doors and windows. Stay put and send a signal, but go out if you've got a gun in a car. You might just as well be trying to sort out a screw-up in your checking account. They said they had doctors and medical supplies. If we could somehow get there, they could help Karen. Sure. Carrying a sick child with a crazy lady in tow and the place crawling with those things. I don't think we have much choice. Do you, Ben? The nearest big town is only about ten miles away, and they're bound to have a checkpoint there. You from this area? Sure. Judy and I were swimming in the lake over there when those things came. We grabbed our clothes, ran over to the house, found, found the old lady who runs the farm dead upstairs. Then Harry and his family showed up. You know, I, I didn't even see her. Where is she? Oh, in one of the bedrooms. Pretty chewed up. She had a ten-year-old grandson, but there's no sign of him. Same age as my oldest boy. What? Nothing. Well, that settles it. We go. And I say we stay till the cops come. Mister, I have never wanted to bust anyone in the mouth as bad as I want to bust you. Your kid's sick and you want to stay here. It's murder to go out there. We'll be dead after 50 yards. Yeah, not in my truck, we won't. You got a truck? Jesus Christ, why didn't you say so? Yeah, yeah there's only enough gas to get us up to the main road and the gas pump out front is locked up. Uh... You gonna volunteer to go out there and bust it open? Well, the key's gotta be somewhere. There, there's a big key ring down in the basement. Well, get it. Are there any uh, jars down there? Jars? Well, some old fruit jars, I think. Well, get them too. And get some kerosene. We're gonna make some Molotov cocktails. Toss them out the upstairs window and drive those things back so we can get to the truck and the pump. Harry? You'll be responsible for throwing the cocktails and for covering the front door while we get the truck. As soon as we're out of here, lock it up. Then be ready to open up sharp when we get back. I'll need to take the gun, then. I I've got to have the gun. Like hell you do. What do you think we're going to use outside? And how do I know you and Tom won't just gas up and go? You don't, prick. That's what makes life so interesting. If we leave, you can just go back down your funk hole like you've been wanting to do all along. Now turn on that goddamn radio, and while we're listening, you can be making the Molotov cocktails. I don't know how to. Well, you fucking learn. Tom, you come over here with those jars. You know how? Sure, we, we learned it in school. <laughs> Some school. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is now midnight Eastern Standard Time. The latest report from the Walter Reed Hospital confirms what many of us have thought all along. The army of aggressors, which is attacking much of the east and midwestern sectors of our country, is made up of dead human beings. I don't need him to tell me that. Will you be quiet? Dead people from morgues, hospitals, funeral homes, as well as many of those killed during the conflict, have returned to life with an insatiable desire to kill other humans and to feast upon their flesh. What has caused this terrible occurrence we cannot say, but speculation focuses upon the recent unsuccessful space probe to Venus. You will remember that the spaceship, carrying with it a high level of radiation, crashed into the Atlantic Ocean just off the eastern seaboard. We may never know the reasons for the horror we are now experiencing, but we emphasize that the marauders are not from another planet, but are recently dead human beings. They can be killed easily by a gunshot or by heavy blows to the head. We also warn you, 
that anyone who dies as a result of being attacked by one of these creatures may also come back to life with the same predatory instincts. The disease is communicable through open wounds, bites, or scratches. Anyone who dies during this emergency must be decapitated or cremated immediately. Harry, where's Helen and Judy? Downstairs with Karen. How'd your kid get sick? She was bitten uh, on the arm uh, by one of those things. You or Helen better stay with her at all times. And you've got to tell Helen what to expect and what we've got to do if she doesn't pull through. You can't do that to her. Well, you heard the radio. If she dies, she won't be the kid you both loved. She'll be a monster. Tom, ask Judy to come up here and keep an eye on Barbara. Harry, you go upstairs and start tossing those Molotov cocktails out the open window. Only don't hit the truck. Once you've got a wall of flame going, you come back running downstairs. And as soon as me and Tom hear you, we'll hit the door. Now, you hang on to that pitchfork in case uh, some of them try to get through. Then make sure the door is closed and barred again. As soon as you hear us drive up to the house, open the door pronto, you hear me? And get all the women ready to make a run for it, huh? Harry climbed the stairs with a box of Molotov cocktails and opened the window on the landing. As he looked out, he saw groups of the dead things huddled all over, like idlers hanging outside an employment exchange. Some were around the truck. Others were standing in the clumps of trees. Viciously, he began to light the Molotov cocktails and hurl them with all his strength through the window. They burst on the gravel path and the grass beyond, flames illuminating the things as they drew back, moaning softly. Some of the kerosene splashed on them, and their bodies flared like dried Christmas trees. While Harry was busy upstairs, Ben and Tom worked feverishly on the door, prying the wood away from the nails as quietly as possible so as not to alert the things outside. Finally, the last barricade was lifted, and soon after they heard Harry's running footsteps on the stairs. They darted out, and Harry reached the door, but not in time to stop a panicked Judy who ran after Tom. Harry knew his duty. He slammed the door shut, in time to see Judy's path blocked by two of the ghouls. By now, Tom had clubbed his way to the truck, climbed into the cab, and was trying to start the engine. Alerted by Judy's screams, Ben turned and drove the stock of his rifle butt into their skulls, grabbed the frightened girl, hurled her into the cab, then jumped into the flatbed. The engine fired, and the truck rocked across the uneven ground and screeched to a halt against the pump. Tom leapt out and fumbled with the lock, but seeing the creatures almost upon him, Ben shoved him back and smashed the lock with his rifle, releasing the gas which spurted in all directions. Picking up the hose, Tom crammed it into the gas tank, spilling a generous sample on the ground while Ben continued to fight off the invaders. Neither of them saw the dying flames from the Molotov cocktails spring into life as they sped across the gas-soaked ground, then leap across the rear fender of the truck. Tom's awareness came from the sudden rush of heat on his back. He yelled, turned and jumped into the cab and gunned the engine, a terrified Judy clinging to him. Ben, knowing that the only escape route was back to the farm, started to run, swinging his gun like a club, head high. Peering through the barricades inside, all that Harry could see was a running man surrounded by misshapen figures and the truck, by now a fiery comet, speeding away into the distance. Suddenly, it exploded in a ball of flame, incinerating its two passengers. Harry... By now, wild with terror, abandoned the locked front door and headed for the cellar. Outside, three ghouls were trying to claw their way in, and Ben quickly pulped their heads like a child demolishing toadstools with his foot. Finding the door locked, he retreated several paces, then hopped towards it, using one leg like a battering ram, and smashing his way through, just in time to see Harry opening the cellar door. Get over here and help me fix this door! Now, you shithead! 
Next time you pull something like this, I'm going to throw you outside and feed you to those things. Except that you're too rotten for even them to eat. Helen, come out of the cellar. Tom and Judy are dead. We're stuck here. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is now 1 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. For the first time, we are seeing signs that the authorities are beginning to get things under control. Civilian personnel working in conjunction with the National Guard have re-established order in most of the affected communities, and while curfews are still in effect, the intensity of the attack is abating. Law enforcement agencies are predicting a return to normality within the week. However, until then, vigilance must be maintained. We must decapitate and burn all corpses. And now a few words from Dr. Lewis Sanford of the local county health department. Dr. Sanford, can you give us any reasons for this phenomenon? We really can't explain it at present. That's not to say that we won't have an answer for you sometime in the near future, but so far our evidence is uh, inconclusive. But what about the Venus probe? Well, what about it? You know as much as I do, and I'm really not qualified to comment on it one way or the other. As you know, I'm a medical pathologist, not an aerospace engineer. What I and my colleagues have been trying to do is to find a medical or pathological reason for something that is without precedent in history. Most likely the uh, causes are due to a virus or viruses that are unknown to us. They could have mutated or been activated by something like the Venus probe. But will it go on, sir? I mean, will we have to keep burning our corpses? Well, why not? Much uh, the most sanitary way of disposing of the dead should have been mandatory years ago. But again, I don't know. It could be that the diseased organisms that cause the horror are short-lived. They may die off quickly or be a mutant breed incapable of reproduction. We're hopeful that this will be the case. Uh, But... Those of you at home listening must decapitate and burn any corpses that might still be lying around. If they are inside the home, just put on some gloves, drag them outside, and put them to the torch. Thank you for those reassuring words, Dr. Sanford. And now, until our next broadcast in one hour, here is some music. All the lights have gone out. Where's the fuse box? Downstairs. There's a flashlight on the stairs. I've got to get that gun, Helen. We can go to the cellar. You've got to help me. He's already beaten you up. Next time he'll kill you. Haven't you done enough damage already? I haven't done any damage. It's him. He's already got two people killed. If only I could get my hands on that gun. Well, fuses are okay. Power lines must be down. I've left the uh, flashlight top of stairs. Helen, why don't you go down and see your daughter? Her breathing sounds kind of strange. They're trying to get in again. Harry, give me a hand over here. Sure. I'll give you a hand. What are you doing with the gun, man? Help me keep those things out. You keep them out, big guy. Oh, you're not so brave without your gun, are you? <laughs> I'm going to the cellar, and I'm taking Helen and that zombie girl with me. And you can stay up here, and I hope they get you quick. Ben turned towards the window where a number of the ghouls were pounding on the timbers. When one plank was loose enough, Ben ripped it aside, then hurled it like a javelin at Harry. It caught him in the arm, and with a cry of pain, he dropped the gun. Ben pounced, and as Harry backed away, he picked it up, cocked it, and fired, blasting a hole in Harry's chest and knocking him head first down the cellar steps. Helen had no time to be a grieving widow. She had other things to think about. Two ghouls had succeeded in breaking through the window and had seized her by the hair and neck. Ben clubbed at them, then shot them both in the face. Freed, Helen ran, screaming down the cellar steps, falling over the body of her husband in the dark and landing in a heap at the bottom. Oh. Mommy? Baby, is that you? Oh, darling, are you feeling better? Mommy, pick me up. 
Oh, baby, come to mommy. I'm so glad that you. <laughs> oh, oh, Karen! No, please! Ah! Ah! Karen wasn't feeling better. Karen wasn't feeling anything at all, except the lust for warm human flesh. For she was dead. Her mother's fall had interrupted her as she was chewing through her father's arm, but she had always liked her mother better anyway. As Helen picked her up, the child in turn picked up a rusty garden trowel and plunged it again and again into her mother's breast, throat, and stomach. She continued long after Helen's screams had ceased, until the flesh was a ragged ruin. Then, contentedly, she dug her hands into the gaping wounds and began to feast. While upstairs, Ben was fighting like a madman. The barricades were crumbling under the onslaught of fifty or so ghouls. Barbara, shocked into consciousness again, was fighting alongside him. One ghoul sank his teeth into her neck until Ben blew off most of his head. Part of its face and jaw still remained embedded in her flesh, and quite mad now, she ran screaming from the room straight into the path of a group of undead who were advancing towards her. They fell upon her, ripping and tearing as they dragged her outside. She fought on automatically until she looked dead into the face of her brother Johnny, who had his fingers locked for the kill. Mercifully, her brain cut out, and seconds later her body followed as she was engulfed. There would be nothing left of her to be reanimated. Ben, outnumbered, retreated slowly towards the cellar. From behind, he felt hands clawing at his legs. Looked down and saw the bloody face of Karen. All normal instincts gone, he picked her up and smashed her against the wall. But she staggered to her feet and advanced again. But too late to stop him leaping down the cellar steps and slamming the door behind him. The door shook and bulged like canvas caught in a strong wind. But miraculously, it held against the onslaught. Little by little. The pounding diminished, and from the shuffling noises above his head, he deduced that the ghouls were leaving the house to feast on the body of Barbara and to wait easier prey. His fingers closed around the discarded flashlight, and he held it upwards to check out his new territory. The first thing it encountered was the shiny bald pate of Harry, then his staring eyes and half-chewed arm. But the eyes were no longer staring. One of them twitched, then the other, and slowly the limbs jerked like those of a man under electric shock therapy. It wasn't easy to hold the light on the thing that wouldn't die and to aim the rifle at the same time. But Ben managed. The bald covering was blown away, and with it, most of Harry's brains splashed against the far wall. Helen's body was in a far worse state of mutilation. Karen had an unholy appetite for a five-year-old, but it too began to roll over and play living until a bullet obliterated its face and head. Now there was no one else left. All of them were dead, except him. As he threw down his rifle in exhaustion, he felt a pain in his right arm. Looking down, he noticed almost absent-mindedly the torn shirt and parallel lacerations caused by Karen's teeth. So, now his name was on the waiting list of the undead club. Sinking into a corner, Ben wept uncontrollably. Then, worn out, fell asleep. His last waking thoughts were on his two children. Hey, Sheriff, how many more places we got in this area, huh? Well, Sergeant, there's another ten I'd like to finish before noon. We'll meet up at the local patrol cars at the Miller Farm. Check it out, then we'll uh, push on. Depending uh, how it is, maybe we'll stop for a break and some coffee there. The men are dog tired. Uh huh. Reckon there'll be anybody left there? How the hell should I know? Doubt it. 
All there is is the old lady and her ten-year-old grandson. Depends upon uh, how many of those things are in the area and whether she could get to somewhere safe. We'll know soon enough. Inside the Miller farm, the cellar was pitch dark. The flashlight battery had expired long ago, but sounds were filtering in. Voices. Human voices. Ben awoke and groped his way up the stairs, stopping in sudden terror as his weight caused them to creak. In the distance, the sheriff was supervising the mopping-up operations, shooting the now sporadic figures of the ghouls. Advancing towards him was a group of uniformed men. Hi, boys. Sure glad to see you. How's it going up at your end? Uh, Not too bad. Things are under control. Uh, Checked out the Miller farmhouse yet? Nah, looks pretty bad. Figured we'd let you take care of that. Oh, 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 thanks a bunch. Uh, Why don't you join us in some coffee up there, huh? Delighted. Sheriff, there's a pocket of them down there. There's ghouls all over the place and a couple of abandoned vehicles. One of them's all burned up. Well, you should be used to it by now. Kill them and burn them. I'll be right down. That's it, man. That's the spirit. Don't let any of them get away now. If you can't blow the head off with one shot, don't waste any more bullets. Huh? Finish it off with your machete. Then drag them over to the pile there and, and set them alight. It was now or never for Ben. He eased the bolt back from the cellar door, flung it wide and rushed out, his momentum carrying him halfway across the room. Still sick with fear, he glanced wildly about. The sunlight streamed through the smashed and partly smashed barricades, but there was no one, dead or undead, on the premises. Outside, the sounds of activity grew closer. A great feeling of relief welled up within him, leaving his legs like jelly. He paused for a moment to regain his strength. Maybe the wounds on his arm were not that bad. In a few hours, he would be safe in a hospital bed. Maybe his boys were okay. Maybe he could get word to them and see them in a day or two. Pumped up with the life-giving force of the morning sun, he crept to the window and cautiously pulled back what remained of the curtain. Hell and damn it, I told you not to shoot. There might still be people in there. Ain't no one in there alive, Sheriff. The place is just about demolished. Whoever was in there is long dead. Well, let's go inside and take a look. Now, careful now. Yeah, just one body here. Cut off his head, quick. I'll take a look upstairs. You know, I wonder who was here. Well, whoever it was, they sure put up a hell of a fight. Couldn't have been Mrs. Miller, Sheriff. There's not a trace of her anywhere. Or her grandson. I guess we ain't ever gonna know. It don't matter a damn now, anyway. 